conversion of an alkene into an alkane corresponds to the addition of the elements of dihydrogen to the alkene. And this is most typically accomplished using hydrogen or dihydrogen gas in the presence of a metal catalyst, most commonly platinum or palladium. This reaction is called catalytic hydrogenation since we're using a metal catalyst in combination with H2 and the elements of hydrogen are adding to the alkene. So for example here, if we draw in the implied hydrogens, we've got two implied hydrogens on the alkene carbons and cyclohexene and in the product cyclohexane we have four. So the elements of dihydrogen have added to the alkene to produce an alkane. This reaction is stereospecifically syn. The two new hydrogens both add to the same side of the alkene, and the mechanistic reasons for this will become clear on the next slide. So for example here, with substituents on the alkene carbons, now we end up with two different stereoisomers. But in both stereoisomeric products, the two new hydrogens are on the same side of the original alkene. In this first, the two hydrogens added from below, and in this second, the two hydrogens added from above. So both of these are syn products. None of the anti-diastereomers where, say, this hydrogen is up or this hydrogen is down are observed. So the reaction is stereospecifically syn. And these two isomers are enantiomers of each other. And because we're starting with an achiral alkene and not using a chiral catalyst, we get a racemic mixture, an equal mixture of the two enantiomers in these hydrogenation reactions. So this is a nice way to go from alkenes to alkanes if that's desired. The mechanism of catalytic hydrogenation is a little bit complicated when we get into the details because it's heterogeneous. We've got a metal catalyst that's solid metal, we've got gaseous hydrogen, and we've got the alkene, which may be there as a pure liquid or maybe in solution, something along these lines. But in broad brush strokes, in broad terms, the way this works is that the metal first activates dihydrogen by essentially adding to it. The metal gets uh, between the two hydrogens breaks the HH bond and we get two new metal hydrogen bonds and you can see a number of these on the surface of the metal catalyst here. Reaction occurs on the surface of the metal catalyst, not internally. The alkene then approaches and essentially inserts itself into one of the metal hydrogen bonds and we end up with a metal carbon bond right here. And that metal carbon bond kind of holds the alkene in place so that uh, it sits still while the other hydrogen adds in a syn manner on the same side as the uh, addition of the first hydrogen. So essentially the fact that this reaction occurs all on the surface and the alkene doesn't have time to rotate after addition of the first hydrogen means that the reaction is stereospecifically syn. And the activation energy lowering effect of the metal catalyst largely comes down to this initial cleavage of the HH bond, which is facilitated by the metal, which is in a relatively low oxidation state. This ultimately oxidizes the metal, at least temporarily, and it's okay with that because metals don't mind oxidation, right? So overall, this catalytic hydrogenation is facilitated by the metal and occurs with syn stereospecificity. To draw the products of catalytic hydrogenations of alkenes, we want to start by looking for the alkene, adding the hydrogens, getting rid of the double bond, and making sure that the hydrogens are added in a syn manner. Thinking about stereoisomers that could form via addition above or below the alkene. So in this first case, we have 1,2-dimethyl, cyclohexene is the substrate, catalytic hydrogenation conditions, so we're going to add dihydrogen, we're going to add two hydrogens, one each to the carbons of the alkene. I like to start just by drawing anything that's not directly involved in the reaction. And key here is to make sure we position the hydrogens in the right place. The hydrogens could come from above or from below. And for example, if we think about the hydrogens coming from below, both would end up on dashes behind the plane of the screen, right? These H's are behind the screen or under the screen. And this corresponds to syn addition, since both hydrogens are on the same side of the original alkene. Now, you may also wonder about adding the hydrogens from above in this case. That would actually give a product that is identical to this. Notice that this molecule has a rotational axis of symmetry this way. So we could turn the molecule over, that would swing the H's above 
the plane of the screen, but that would be the exact same molecule just viewed from a different perspective. So whether the H is add from below or from above, we're going to get a single product, which is this. And we'll see none of the anti-diastereomer, for example, where this H is above the plane or on a wedge rather than a dash. We see none of that because hydrogenation is stereospecifically set. In the second case, we're going to play the same game. Let's start by drawing the backbone. We're going to end up with two stereoisomers here, so I've drawn the backbone twice. And key now is figuring out where the methyl and hydrogen groups are located at these carbons that were originally involved in the alkene. We want to make sure to add the two hydrogens from the same side of the original alkene. For example, if we added both below, imagining H2 kind of coming from behind, both of the new H's end up on dashes, and the methyl groups there end up on wedges. We could also imagine adding the H's from above, in which case both of the H's would be on wedges, and both of the methyl groups would be on dashes. And both of these correspond to syn addition of the hydrogens, right? Since the hydrogens are on the same side of the alkene in both products. But each of these is now chiral. And these two molecules are not the same. This is worth pausing and verifying on your own. But they are mirror images. And I think the easiest way to see this is maybe to turn this molecule around like so, have the ethyl groups facing each other, and you'll see that these are mirror images. Because each one is chiral and they're mirror images, these are enantiomers. And because we started with an achiral alkene and used achiral reaction conditions, we'd expect a 50-50 mixture of these two enantiomers or a racemic mixture or racemate. Hydrogenation is a very attractive way to think about establishing a stereocenter, right? We can start, for example, with an achiral alkene like this and imagine if, you know, this has an H attached to it, there's going to be no stereocenter there in the product, but I've established a new stereocenter here in the product. If I could do that selectively to generate one enantiomer of product, this, this again, is, is highly, highly attractive if I need one enantiomer of product. And quite commonly, I need one enantiomer. For example, pharmaceuticals nowadays are almost always prepared as single enantiomers because the opposite enantiomer can have toxic effects on chiral systems, chiral molecules within the body. So hydrogenation, enantioselective hydrogenation, is a highly attractive methodology. And it's been highly, highly developed to be very, very selective for single enantiomers. The basic idea here is that we use a single enantiomer of a chiral catalyst. This acts like a single hand, right? And what the, what the chiral catalyst does is selects for a particular hand of product in the same way that when you're taking your left hand and putting on a pair of gloves, you're going to selectively pick up that left hand glove and put it on your left hand. Right? The chiral catalyst does something very, very similar conceptually, selecting for a single hand, quote unquote, of the product. Only this enantiomer with little to none of the minor enantiomer, assuming we've got a good chiral catalyst on our hands. So in this particular case, we're using a ruthenium-based catalyst. There still needs to be a metal there to get kind of the mechanistic basis of catalysis. But the ligand connected to the metal is chiral, making the overall complex chiral. H2 is still achiral, but once it gets involved with the ruthenium, we've got a chiral hydrogen-containing complex on our hands and selectivity, ultimately, for one enantiomer over the other. This reaction coordinate diagram in the bottom right shows the idea for this case. With no catalyst, we've got a completely different mechanism, right? And with the catalyst, we've got, for example, more elementary steps, and the overall activation energy is lowered in both cases, leading to both enantiomers. However, because the catalyst is chiral, these transition states are now diastereomeric. They have different energies. And for example, the red, the, the uh, transition state, rather, leading to the red product is lower in energy than the transition state leading to the green product, making this the major enantiomer observed. In Chem 2311, we're not going to worry about the mechanistic basis of this, the stereochemical, you know, steric arguments that go into explaining why this is the major isomer. I just mentioned it here because enantioselective hydrogenation is one of the most common and important methods for establishing new stereocenters with very, very high enantioselectivity, with high selectivity for a single configuration of product.